In a referendum in June last year, Britons voted to leave the European Union. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, firmed up the Brexit vote by saying that there is no half-in or half-out, and that no deal for Britain is still better than a bad deal. But last week, the Supreme Court said Brexit can only happen through a vote of Parliament. What does this mean for Britain and the future of Europe? And most of all, what does it mean for Filipinos who live, work, and study or invest there? Good evening. I'm Tony Abad, and this is Political Capital. With us tonight, the British Ambassador to the Philippines, His Excellency Asif Ahmad. Your Excellency, good evening, and thank you for making time for us here on Bloomberg TV. Well, it's a pleasure, Tony. So the British Supreme Court ruled that Article 50 can only be accessed through Parliament, which means that there's actually a lengthier exit uh, process. What does this mean for the UK and then for its partners, the political and trading partners? Well, I think first and foremost, what this shows is that the institutions in our systems are working yes. rather than not working. You know, we had a, a referendum yes. and that clearly indicated a clear uh, indication that that was the will of the majority. We had uh, the executive through the prime minister setting out her case for uh, how she will put through the implications of, of the referendum. And that actually preceded the Supreme Court ruling. Yes. Now, what the Supreme Court has said effectively is that uh, by all means, go ahead and do what you need to do. But we entered the EU through an act of parliament mm -hmm. and it should be parliament therefore that uh, decides. But I don't think the timetable will be derailed because Theresa May as prime minister said just a few weeks ago that her ambition was to uh, trigger uh, our exit by the end of March. Okay. And I think that is still on track. Okay. And the uh, resolution that has been put to our parliament, the, the bill, is actually a very straightforward one. Yes. It simply says, will parliament give the executive the authority to trigger Article 50? Yes. And it's a very simple question. So now, it, Parliament is sovereign. It is our most sovereign body. Right. Uh, and members of Parliament are entitled to what they wish. Yes. But they will be very cognizant of the will of the people, the, the determination of this government to okay. finish the negotiations. Because, of course, my next question was, can Parliament actually change uh, the result? In other words, can Parliament decide, no, no, let's... let's uh, Let's not well, push through with this. At, the, at its most extreme, you know, we're even a constitutional monarchy. The parliament can even decide how the, the monarch uh, uh, inter, uh, basically interfaces with the rest of the country. It is a supreme body, but these are responsible people. They are politicians who are responsible to their constituencies, and they know what the mandate is. Okay. But the, well, speaking of the mandate, now, you had a close vote. I mean, technically speaking, 37% versus 35 Then, of course, you have 28% not voting. So effectively, you have over 60% not voting for the Brexit. Now, does that mean that Parliament might say, oh, maybe we have to get a better pulse of, of, of the people and, and see what they, what they think again? No, I think every country has its own voting system, and we've yes. just seen what happened in the United States here, in your own country yes. here, with, with President Duterte emerging. Uh, there will always be this question about the people who didn't vote, yes. but basically you can only count the ones who turned up. Right. And on that basis, there's no doubt in the United Kingdom that, yes. uh, and Theresa May, you know, let's be clear, she originally campaigned for the EU to, to remain. But mm -hmm. as Prime Minister, she res respects the view of the uh, majority, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to be doing. So there's no so turning back from the decision of, of leaving. It's how we leave, when, and where, uh, in what way we define the terms of that uh, departure. Now, what is the implication on trading partners like the Philippines and uh, the rest of the world? Well, there are a number of things that are happening. Uh, first of all, the, the Philippines itself is currently engaging in a free trade agreement negotiations uh, with the EU. That's correct. And until such time as we remain in the EU arrangement, of course, we are party to that deal. Now, we already have some pre-existing uh, FTAs around the world. And common sense says that you basically co-op those once they're com completed, you don't go back to zero. Yes. Uh, so that so it really depends on how far we progress as the EU here in the Philippines. If it's right. a done deal by the time we leave, then chances are that we will simply take it on, on uh, board. Okay. So if you have an existing, you're part of an existing EU FTA with another country, the trade relation based on that that FTA will will remain. That's the, the objective of the, uh, of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, we don't want to reopen every single deal uh, around the world. But there are some important connections we are already making, which yes. is, we, as, as part of the EU, we can't actually start 
detailed negotiations today. Yes. But from the Prime Minister's visit to the United States, from the indications that we've had from Australia, uh, from many other uh, countries, there's a willingness and a realization that as a major economy, the fastest growing G7 country right now, yes. uh, you cannot simply ignore commercial ties uh, with the United Kingdom. That's right. Now, if EU FTA were to push through with the Philippines, I think it's going to take maybe a good part of a, still a year. You know, we're still looking at probably next year. In the meantime, you said March is on track. So by the time we have the EU FTA, it's probably the UK is already long exited. No, it's not long exited. I think this is the thing that we need to explain a bit better, yes. which is that, the, that when we say give notice that we're going to leave, there's a two-year process of negotiations and getting the details correct. And yes. then there'll be a period, hopefully not very long, we're not talking about a decade of, of, of an interregnum, we're yes. talking about a few more months, if not a year or so, All right. of an adjustment period of where various protocols come into place. Okay. Now where the trade deals come into it, I do not know, but that's one of the more complex areas yes. of what we have to agree. All right. So that, that may be still subject of sort of discussion and... Uh, and mutual agreement. Mutual agreement. What about the Philippines? I mean, initially, uh, what are you seeing as the implication, not just, you know, in the short term, but say in the medium term, on the UK and Philippines relations? Yeah. About five years ago, we made a bet that the Philippines would be one of the top 40 emerging powers in the world, not yes. just as an economy, okay. politically, its regional impact as a member of ASEAN, and simply its global reach in terms of everything it does, whether yes. there's people-to-people -people links or just simply being a, a source of, of inspiration. That's why my embassy is twice as big as it's the one I inherited uh, three and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, we, our embassy here has actually grown, whilst others, ironically in the EU, were, were, were contracted. Were, were contracted. I think you're the BPO of a large part of the yes, uh, UK the, embassies. Half <laughs> of the world's uh, embassies that we have, their transactions are run here from the, when they buy something to when they make payments. Yes. We do the recruitment for our staff all in, uh, in Asia Pacific. It's been a huge success, Filipino run. Great. When we come back, let's talk more about bilateral relations between the UK and the Philippines. Please stay with us. You're still with Political Capital. I'm Tony Abad, together with our guest, His Excellency, British Ambassador to the Philippines, Asif Ahmad. Your Excellency, British Trade Envoy Richard Graham, who visited us um, last year, spoke of the possibility of a bilateral free trade agreement between the UK and the Philippines. Um, is this, well, are you looking at this as a real possibility or, you know, sort of speculating based on, on what you said was sort of the the, the winding down period uh, after Brexit? Yeah, there are many things that are happening simultaneously. Yes. I was, the big issue of the day is how we will negotiate our trading arrangement with the EU itself yes. once we leave. And that's a big component. I mean, you know, we have huge amounts of trade and investment right. going backwards and forwards. Maybe about 300 billion pounds worth of, of, of exports coming from France, Germany, etc. to our country. So that's going to be important. Obviously, the big economies are going to be important. But because you, the Philippines, are part of a, a dynamic trading bloc, and ASEAN itself is, some, is a vital market for us. You know, we sell more to ASEAN than we do to China or India. Okay. So people keep talking about the, the, the big yeah, giants of right. Asia, but you know, you're part of a, ASEAN. Yeah, you are <laughs> part of something really big. So if the train has already left in terms of negotiating a, a bilateral trade deal between the EU and the Philippines, and if this matures, then we yes. will harvest that. If okay. not, we will have to then determine which ones can we focus on first, which ones do we develop. But longer term, the Philippines yes. has to be part of the equation. It is just too dynamic an economy for us to ignore. Okay. Getting to specifics of this trade relation between the Philippines and, and the UK, whether or not we, we have it sort of under the e, still, still under the, sort of the EU arrangement or a new one under the EU, uh, sort of bilateral UK Philippines uh, what what areas are we looking at in terms of uh, I guess focus priority you know I like to start with things that are real and that are happening now yes. because otherwise everything sounds like I'm making promises about the future you know we are already the UK the number one investor here in the Philippines yes. from the EU and in everything from oil and gas to uh, cars okay. to making electronics uh, in the service industry, it's very wide base. That's an important thing. Our exports to the Philippines uh, last year grew by 38%, the second fastest in the world. That's but the, the other story which is really interesting is the way in which the Philippines has now matured. 
and two successive investments in the UK. The one was White and Mackay by uh, Emperor Dor, yes. and more recently by Mondenison in corn, which it basically makes a meat substitute product, yes. which actually is a strategic investment because that's about the protein future of this planet, and Philippines is right at the heart of this. Now, if from zero you've got to over a billion pounds worth of investment in the space of 18 months, yes. just think what's possible. And you've got a capital rich uh, economy here. The other thing that I discovered in my time here, which initially I just heard whispers about, because I kept on hearing people here from corporate Philippines, the big companies who are listed on the stock exchange, saying, yes. oh, we're going to the UK and Edin uh, London and uh, Edinburgh for a roadshow. And I said, why? It turns out that the portfolio investors, the people who buy and hold the shares of corporate Philippines, we're the number one investor in the world. And we've been doing this for decades, so this is not some new story. So you put it all together. Our investment in corporate Philippines, our investment uh, uh, here. What are those areas that are sort of on your wish list if, if the Philippines were really to take seriously this, this opportunity? Well, you know, uh, what the UK wants for the Philippines is what Filipinos want for the Philippines. You okay. know, we want better infrastructure so that our things don't get stuck, okay, so that I don't yes. spend half my life on EDSA and, yes. and actually get to productive meetings. So you support build, build, build? Build, but responsibly and make yes. it affordable. I think uh, if you look at the 10 point economic plan of this country, I give it 10 out of 10. You okay. know, uh, it's an excellent plan. It's just a question of now getting down to hard work and making it happen. Okay. Including zero? Well, zero is an issue, yes. uh, uh, which you're referring to the war on drugs. Yes. Now, it, it may surprise you, but per capita, the UK probably has as big a problem on drugs as the Philippines does. Okay. So this is not a unique problem, problem here. Yeah. Our approach to it is different. Uh, we see it as a health issue. And more recently, because of things we've seen, I think one has to have full confidence in the law enforcement agencies. And I agree with the president, President Duterte, when he says that uh, the PNP needs to be cleaned up because there's nothing worse than having mistrust in a person in or out of uniform as right. to whether they're doing their job. You know, we're in this together. You can't win this alone here in the Philippines. Right, right. Now, what about investment? Is there anything that you, you've sort of identified or zeroed in on, as well as the constitutional uh, restrictions? Sure. A uh, lot, lot of it is constitutional, but a yes. lot of it's about practice. For example, I mean, it's simple practice, which you don't need any kind of change in law. There are many things that when you import components here, they're subject to zero VAT. Okay. But what actually happens is that it's collected and then appropriated out as though it was a budget expenditure. So there's an artificial cap in the refunds All that right. businesses are entitled to, which is really inefficient because yes. you're holding on to somebody else's money, which is working capital. So that doesn't need constitutional change. Yeah. But there are other areas, for example, rather absurdly, a foreign investor here can own 100% of a coal belching power station, but only 40% of a, a renewable energy uh, Okay. And, and many senators have said that this is absurd, this was never designed to be so. The most touchy issue here uh, is land, okay. you know, ownership of land. Yes. Now, I can understand the sensitivities that maybe you don't want foreigners to own land, but there's nothing to stop you from giving out 99-year leases. Yes. Because the issue is not okay. the, who owns the land, but what use is being made of the land. Of course, this, this issue of federalism and speaks of... Uh a new constitutional structure, you mm. know, a whole political structure uh, that, that Duterte has actually envisioned for the Philippines. The issue is not about systems, it's about the intention. What is it that you're trying to achieve? And now there's clearly been regional imbalance here in the Philippines that yes. needs to be redressed. And I think one of the reasons why we have President Duterte is because of that yes. redress that's needed. So it's not a question of which system is better. And some of it actually doesn't need federal at all. It's yes. about budget allocations. Right. Nothing is that's stopping right. you from sending more resources to Samar, Leyte or Mindanao. Uh, and n nothing to stop you from having a COA that can maintain real oversight as to how money is spent. What do you think about the parliamentary system? You know, it was tried here for, yeah, I think what I like about the parliamentary system is that every congressman or senator is accountable to a constituency. Yes. Here you have a hybrid. Yes. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, what happens if you like a, a head of government? Here you, yes, yeah, right. after six years, the end, goes, the yeah. end. But what if you dislike somebody or something happens as we saw with Brexit, something traumatic happens yes. and our Prime Minister says, okay, I, I made the case, I lost, over to somebody else. So I think it's a more accountable system. But I've seen systems that are different work equally well. Yes. It's a question of how systems are used and what is the intention behind these intention. systems. Okay. Defense and security issues. That's what we have when we come back with British Ambassador Asif Ahmad. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Political Capital. Still with our guest, His Excellency, British Ambassador to the Philippines, Asif Ahmad. Your Excellency, on security aspects, we understand that there's a new defense agreement that's supposed to be, uh, uh, that's supposed to have been signed. Um, what kind of defense, you know, defense issues are we looking at? Um, and I guess your thoughts on sort of, you know, this, this pivoting, China to Japan to Russia, Sure. I think, uh, f first and foremost, we had a choice. Uh, at the tail end of the Aquino administration, our previous MOU was expiring. Okay. Now, what we could have done was just sneaked it in under the table in, at midnight. But we felt that we, it was more honest to yes. actually put it to the new government and take into account yes. the, the changes that have That's taken right. place. That's a good move. <laughs> the things that have been uppermost in our minds uh, have been shaped by a number of events. For me, the biggest one was Typhoon Yolanda. It happened uh, literally days after I presented my credentials. You know, we deployed 1,400 military and aid personnel. We had mm -hmm. ships, uh, and Royal Air Force planes, soldiers on the ground here. Now, if you don't have a defense protocol, how do you provide humanitarian relief? Yes. If something goes wrong, if there's an accident, if there's a counterclaim, uh, these are important things to have in place. Then, you know, we are a member of the UN Security Council, a permanent member. That yes. means we have this responsibility for global security. So if there are regional tensions, if there are issues that require both soft and hard diplomacy and, uh, and, and willingness to come to the aid of, a, of an ally, you know, we have a proven record in this. And our defense expenditure is actually right up there. We made a commitment that 2% of our GDP would be spent on, on defense, and we've kept that honor. The only NATO member outside of the US okay. that is able to do this. So we are a strong military power, but yes. our military has many facets. It is both capable right. of, of the hard stuff as well as the, the, the relief. So we want to do that. The other thing we've been doing a lot is specialist training uh, with the Philippines on uh, things like um, anti-terrorism action, uh, cyber crime, yes. and the like. Now, this requires a very different and more agile. Uh, okay. And then anti-submarine uh, helicopters, which are, the Philippines are now buying from, from the UK. So it's the intelligence community? Like well, we have a, a, James our, Bond and, and, <laughs> and the rest. James Bond is for the movies. You know, the, the real life James Bonds are doing what I call day to day work, yes. uh, um, protecting ourselves. And they've done a great job, uh, both here. But we are allies. You know, we are, we are part of an intelligence community, which the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, we are part of a community. Yes. And you benefit from it. I mean, uh, some of the big uh, drug busts here came uh, as a result that of, of that, yeah. that community working together. Okay, it's an important point. Now, how do you see China? You know, as a 13-year-old, I lived in China when my father was working there uh, for a different country. And he told me then, just, son, watch this country. And true, you know, this country has really become an economic power. It right. has a, a, a great role in the big institutions of, of, the, of the world, and we welcome that. The next generation of nuclear power stations in the UK will be Chinese and French built. So you know, we have no fear about China being our, our partner. Yes. But our ambition has always been to, to uh, have China as a country that embraces a rules-based world. And uh, when the ruling came of, from, on the arbitral courts on, yes. on the, the validity of, of the Philippines' case, you know, we firstly said the Philippines was within its rights to bring that case, that, and the freedom of navigation should be, uh, per, go unhindered. And you know we will be there when uh, when the circumstances call for themselves. So I mean, our new generation of uh, aircraft carriers will yes. be deployed as much in this theater as they will in in other places. So we take our responsibility globally because we are a global country with a global outlook. Yes. And we would encourage the, the yes. Philippines to have a close relationship with with, uh, with China. Yes. But uh, fundamentally, though, we believe that you can make new friends and not lose old ones. Uh, so it's a it's a win win. Yes. There's no reason why you shouldn't have friendly relations with with everybody um, and China is, is hugely important for, for not just for the Philippines for the, the future of the global economy. Before we close I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on I guess the, 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 whole, the whole idea of human rights. The UK has, has been a proponent of human rights uh, all over the world. Now what, what is your view and your take on you know the, the way things have been unfolding and, and maybe the tensions last year that have been raised on that issue? Sure. These are very, very important questions. And I think one of the things that's worth remembering is that uh, although we might be leaving the European Union, our values are, are very similar. Yes. And our, our the workers' rights, gender rights, uh, the right 
of people with different sexual preferences to be respected, yes. ethnicity, religion. I mean, all of these things are enshrined in our, psych in our psyche in a very powerful way, and nothing's going to change that. Surely, you know, if you're arrested, you want to have the right to a, a lawyer. You want your day in court. You, you want to have that opportunity to prove your, your case one way or the other and to seek re redress. But also for justice to be exercised in a humane way. And we are on the record as saying we oppose the death penalty. Okay. Uh, strongly for a number of reasons. Firstly, if it had worked by now, it would have been, problems would have been solved in, uh, in China, in, in, right. in uh, America, many other parts of the world. It clearly hasn't. And each time a case comes up of a Filipino coming under uh, the threat of being executed, the whole national emotion arises yes. quite naturally. We would feel the same in, in the UK. So it is important that we make that point and make that very, very strongly because uh, for the Philippines, having made that journey uh, of enlightenment for yes. it to go back into the dark ages would be unforgivable. Your Excellency, thank you very much for being with us. We would like to express our appreciation to His Excellency, British Ambassador to the Philippines, Asif Ahmad, for his time. That's all we have for tonight. I'm Tony Abad for Political Capital. We will see you again next week.